Just what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about KTI Knowledge Transfer Ireland and then I'm going to talk specifically about the National IP Protocol 2016. Uh, so Knowledge Transfer uh, Ireland, we're, we're based in Enterprise Ireland, okay? So we're a relatively small group. There are six of us in total. Uh, most of us are EI employees. We're supported by the IUA, Irish University Association. Uh, we have very strong links and relationships with the technology transfer offices right across the RPOs, RPOs research portfolio organizations. We have an industry advisory board, a stakeholder forum, etc. And ultimately, we report into the Department of Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation. Um, what does KTI do? Well, in recognition of the fact that government supports uh, puts in around 700 million per annum into uh, publicly funded research, there's a significant amount of IP coming from that, as we all know. And KTI's role is to put in place the necessary structures and facilities to ensure that good tech transfer, IP due diligence, etc., are done to commercialise that IP from, the, from publicly funded research. That's our main remit. I only have 15 minutes, so I'll keep on, on, on lashing through the slides. This is who we are. Alison Campbell is the director. Uh, some of you will know Peter O'Fagan and Susan Hanna, who have been in the space for quite a period of time. Elizabeth McCarvel is our new communications manager. And Keane is our intern. He's also here and is around for the rest of the afternoon, like myself, to answer any questions or queries that you have. Uh, I keep flipping through the slides. So that's a little bit about KTI. The uh, government, a couple of years ago, put together a think tank of experts in the area of tech transfer from industry, academia, etc. And there are a number of recommendations. One was to set up a central technology transfer office, which is ourselves, KTI. And then secondly, uh, uh, the National IP Protocol was published, published in 2012. What we have today is that protocol uh, updated, okay? National IP Protocol 2016. It's a very important document, uh, particularly for anybody who is uh, in industry seeking to collaborate with academia, anybody in academia who is commercializing research, anybody in the tr tech transfer profession, etc. We strongly recommend that you, you take the opportunity to review it. Um, what is the protocol? What is the National IP protocol? Basically, it sets out the rules for collaboration between industry and academia, okay? Um, the, the revised protocol, it's an easier read. We've taken away some of the roadblocks from the previous versions, etc. And we've broken it down into two publications. Uh, one is the policy document, which I'm going to take you through in a moment. And then the second part of the uh, protocol is what we call the resource guide, which talks about IP guidelines, the various resources, model agreements, practical guides that we carry uh, have been put into, into the resource guide. <coughs> National policy within the protocol says things like uh, we must maximise uh, economic and societal benefits from, pu from public investment in R&D. Um, the system should enable all enterprises to access and exploit IP quickly and easily. Uh, and there should be consistency of approach with regards to those sorts of discussions. So irrespective of the size of a company, whether it's an MNC or an SME, and irrespective of who they are engaging with, whether it's a university, an IOT, or a research performing organization. Everybody should expect a discussion and a negotiation up front prior to any collaboration taking place. So that issues and strategies around IP are clearly agreed up front. There's no surprises. And, and uh, there should be a rigorous with regard, rigor with regards to that discussion. And it should take place over a reasonable time frame, okay? That's what the protocol clearly states. Um, it also talks about HEIs and RPOs uh, should benefit from the commercialization process and there should be incentives for academics to embark on this sort of work. Okay. Um, there's three main pillars that, that I refer to when we talk about accessing IP from publicly funded research. One is where the IP is being totally funded by the university, for example. So we could be talking about IP coming from Enterprise Ireland's commercialization fund. The second one is where it's funded totally by industry. And then the third one is where it's jointly funded. IP has been jointly funded by industry and academia. So we could be referring to Enterprise Ireland's Innovation Partnership Program, for example. This is relatively easy to deal with in terms of accessing IP. So 
and, co and colleges or POs uh, can grant industry uh, exclusive or non-exclusive licenses on fair, uh, fair commercial terms, okay? This is what the protocol st states, states, this is what the tech transfer offices uh, have signed up to. In exceptional circumstances, uh, the IP may be assigned, okay? Um, with regards to assignment, uh, it's not always favoured. Uh, there may be issues around state aid. So again, academics, companies looking to get IP, uh, where they haven't put any money in the pot, essentially need to be aware of state aid issues. And very quickly, state aid, here's the definition, may be deemed as giving it directly to a company by government. For, for example, it hasn't made the full cost of collaborative research. Okay? So again, these are the sorts of things and areas that the IP protocol are covering. They go through it in a lot more detail than, than we're taking through here today in the slide. But again, what I just want to do is give you a quick whistle stop tour of what the IP protocol contains. Column B, as I call it, access to IP and collaborative research wholly funded by industry. In a lot of cases, industry would have the desire to get full assignment of that IP. And that's a reasonable request, but the IP protocol says things like the college should check to see whether or not the industry partner has the wherewithal to, to commercialize that IP in all fields and all territories. And if the answer is no, um, you should look at alternative routes, okay? You should look at perhaps uh, non-exclusive royalty-free licenses uh, or exclusive licenses, for example. And again, this is what the IP protocol uh, brings out. And these are the sorts of issues that industry should have with academia right before uh, research commences, okay? Um, remember that the RPO will retain the right to use any foreground IP, irrespective of whether it's licensed or not, for research and teaching purposes. And uh, if the company gets assignment, they may have to carry the burden of patent costs, for example. Okay. Uh, the definition for collaborative research, I've just stuck it in there, okay? So, work involving research of mutual interest for an industry party works with an RPO. And again, the protocol covers all relevant terms and definitions. Access to IP and collaborative research partially funded by industry. So again, an example, as I said earlier on, is IP uh, developed Horizon Fund funding under EI's Innovation Partnership Program. Um, the industry could be putting in cash or in kind. Um, and again, uh, what the protocol clearly states is that the IP access route should be clearly outlined before any research is undertaken. Uh, in this particular case, industry will have the right to negotiate and conclude a license to foreground IP. Um, if, you, if you negotiate that right, you're getting a service and you pay VAT. If you negotiate an option to license, you're not getting a service, you don't have to pay VAT. So just to make that, make that particular point. Don't necessarily want you to read all of this, the remainder of that slide, but there are various access routes where you've joined funding. And basically, it boils down to the more industry pays, the more rights it has, starting from the right to assignment, a right to a non-exclusive royalty-free uh, license in the field or territory, all the way down to an option to a cost-bearing or non-exclusive license. And again, if, if these terms don't mean a whole lot to you, again, the protocol goes through all of these, these items, etc. So the more industry pays, the more rights it has to, to IP, which is generated. Um, sticking with, with this particular uh, joint, joint funding by industry and academia, um, the industry party may also be able to take assignment of what are known as non-severable improvements, okay? So this is basically where industry is bringing in background IP which is required to develop or uh, to develop foreground IP, that's known as non-severable improvements. Um, and it's linked to an industry partner's pre-existing IP uh, called significant uh, background IP. Again, um, the majority of IP introduced into a project is not expected to fall into this category. But again, if, if these terms and concepts are new to you or you haven't come across them before, reading the protocol, familiarizing yourself with the protocol is hugely important, really, really important. Um, the, new, the latest version of the protocol does not refer to joint ownership of IP. It's difficult, it's complex. Uh, we, we try and avoid it, okay? And, and in a lot of cases, it, it can be avoided. Non-severable improvements, 
Okay, so IP that as a minimum was created using significant background IP introduced in, into the program. <laughs> and significant background IP, again, definitions are there uh, with regards to significant background IP. Um, so background IP, which is the subject of a, of a granted patent. Um, Any time uh, academia engages with industry, or RPOs engage with industry, five minutes, uh, they should enter into a collaborative research agreement. And the IP protocol carries model template agreements, practical guides for all the agreements we carry. And the research agreements will take you through various different issues that you need to address, such as um, providing mechanisms for identification protection of IP during the project, um, dealing with publication of research results, etc. Um, and again, recently we've concluded uh, the development of model collaborative research agreements where wholly funded by industry are partially funded by industry. And again, uh, we carry all this information on our website. So here we have the decision tree with regards to collaborative research agreements. So for example, will, and I know you probably can't read this, but at the top here it says, will industry wholly fund the project? No. If it does, uh, you use the uh, model collaborative agreement wholly funded by industry. Available rights to foreground IP assignment, uh, if required, ca can be granted. And, and it comes down through the various different options. So it's quite straightforward to find out and work out what sorts of agreements you need to be referring to. With the model agreements we carry on our website, you don't have to use them, but you're invited to have a look at them, copy paste certain sections from them, bring them along to a negotiation, um, um, should, should you wish, etc. So the aim is that they're a starting guide. The protocol also covers things like general principles in IP licensing. Again, uh, these are issues that you would need to familiarize yourself when you're embarking on collaborative research. Um, just with the time left, I'm going to finish up fairly quickly, but just to say a few things about the resource guide. Um, it provides uh, national IP management requirements. So, in other words, this is to give uh, industry and funding agencies the confidence that uh, researchers and RPOs have effective tools and procedures in place uh, when it comes to due diligence and IP management, etc. Uh, within the and and some of those management requirements are listed there. Um, Within the resource guide, we carry details of our model uh, agreements. So we have uh, model licensing agreements, agreements uh, on, on option agreements, materials transfers agreements, confidentiality agreements, heads of agreements, PI undertaking forms, etc. Things like getting a PI to sign off and say, if I create IP, I have no right over to it. My university actually owns the IP. And getting researchers and postdocs and postgrads, etc., to understand what it is and what their obligations are, are around IP. So again, all these forms are contained on our website. Uh, we have practical guides as well to assist you to understand what the forms are all about. So with two minutes left, uh, I just want to draw your attention to the other things, tools if you like that we provide in KTI on our website. We provide a, uh, an expert database. We carry details of over 8,000 academic researchers, okay? You can put in a key term search by materials. Uh, fifth uh, right there was Jonathan Coleman. We get a word cloud for his particular publications and his expertise, and you can make direct contact with, with these particular experts through, the, through our website. We also carry full details of all the research centers, uh, technology centers, technology gateways, SFI centers on our, on our website. Uh, we provide quarterly updates for licensing opportunities from all RPOs within the system. So, uh, in, in summary, um, the, the whole idea of the protocol is to speed up the negotiation, okay, is to demystify that whole process of how academics and industry should engage together and take some of the huge financial cost out of uh, bringing yourself up to speed with regards to IP related issues by virtue of the fact of the model agreements that we carry. Um, so again, the message is uh, take, please take the opportunity to uh, take a look at the IP protocol. Copies of it are available at STAT 19 through FR Kelly. You'd be glad to hear that we have a summary of the, of the protocol as well, okay? So that's available as well and all our contact details are uh, on our website. So. Please come and talk to us at any stage. Uh, if, if you want to talk today, please come talk to us, give us feedback, tell us what you like, etc. 
and uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks very much.